Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Okay, we're back on a given Monday with energy. This is Think Tech, and this is Mina, Marco, and me on Monday, except Mina is missing. So it's Mina, Marco, me, Mina missing on Monday. And Marco is here. Hi, Marco. And now we're actually post Mary Monarch. So Mary Monarch Monday, aloha to you, Jay. That's Marco Mangelsdorf. He's the president of ProVision Solar in Hilo. Joins us every two weeks for a show updating us on events in energy, especially clean energy. So uh, it's, great. it's great to talk with you, Marco. And I would like to cover some of the things that are happening these days. Uh, one of them is the uh, appointment um, and ultimately, soon enough, the consent of the Senate uh, to Jennifer Potter as the third uh, commissioner on the, on the PUC. What do you know? So Jenny Potter was nominated a number of weeks ago by Governor David Ige. She comes uh, with a very strong uh, both academic and utility background, spending some time with uh, the Sacramento Municipal Utility District, also known as SMUD. Uh, she moved to Hawaii, I believe it was 2015-ish, uh, and she goes for a uh, boat in uh, Senator Roz Baker's uh, Consumer Protection and Health Committee in the Senate on Thursday, this Thursday. I expect uh, six to nothing, I believe there are six members, five or six members of that committee, and then I believe that they'll vote unanimously to uh, send her nomination to the entire Senate. And that would leave a final vote, uh, which I believe will be, I'll go on a limb here, 25 to nothing, 25 uh, of, in favor and none opposed. Uh, that it will take place either next week or the following week, because we have all but three weeks, including this one, left for our legislative session before our legislature comes to a close. So I think the governor made an excellent choice uh, with Ms. Potter, and I think she'll be a great addition not to uh, diss uh, Lorena Kiba at all. I'm, I think very highly of Lorena as, as well. But her, her term comes to an end on June 30th, and uh, the governor elected to uh, put uh, his own pick there, since Lorraine was a, uh, an appoint, appointee from uh, EGIT's predecessor, Neil Abercrombie. So I, I think it was a great choice, and I think she will bring a great perspective uh, to the commission. And I'm, I'm pleased that there will be two walks uh, there at the commission, uh, both uh, Dr. Jay Griffin, who I think very highly of, and now Jenny Potter, assuming she gets uh, uh, through the Senate, which I'm sure she will be, and then uh, Randy Iwase, who's a lawyer by training and former legislator who will continue to be chair. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with all of that. And I, I, I ran into uh, Jennifer Potter last week um, in the legislature, and uh, she was nice to meet her. She's very vivacious and uh, energetic, and uh, and smart, and uh, and and relatable. So I think she's a good addition with her credentials uh, to the PUC. It'll be now. It'll be two wonks and one uh, government guy. It'll be interesting, <laughs> and you know, and um, you know. But I, I think the secret is is to have the wonks. Uh, we need policy. We need long-term policy, carefully figured out. Um, but we also need for them to listen to business, listen to the utility, um, you know, and listen to government, listen to the people, because uh, those those are factors that have to be taken into into account. No matter how many wonks there are on the PUC, they would they have to listen to business, to the utility, uh, uh, the, the university. I'm not concerned about because they are both. Uh, wants from the university uh, and government in general, the people. So I think it'll work out fine. I think uh, Jay and Jennifer are terrific additions, both of them. Um, and it's, it's it's a new dawning, a new dimension, a new generation, if you will, on the PUC right now. Uh, and it, it bespeaks of good things. And I think uh, another thing that's kind of perhaps worth noting, Jay, is that there was a fair amount of uh, brouhaha with the departure, uh, the un- uh, unwilling departure of Mike Champley a couple of years ago, right prior to the announcement of uh, the commission uh, turning down uh, next year's bid to acquire HEI, and then uh, uh, the interim appointment of Tom Gorak, which caused uh, our colleague Mina Morita to file a lawsuit, which is still pending before the Hawaii Supreme Court. 
So the, the commission was kind of embroiled in politics, uh, has been embroiled in politics to a degree that uh, I think has been um, unhelpful for the overall process and for the state. And that uh, is uh, coming to an end, I think. It's becoming uh, uh, more in the rearview mirror that the stuff with Champley went down and Tom Gorick went down, and now we're hopefully in a period of greater uh, stability uh, with the uh, appointments of, of Jay Griffin and now the appointment and hopeful, nomination, uh, hopeful confirmation of, of Jenny Potter. Yeah, and, and uh, since uh, both these two additions are policy-oriented people, uh, hopefully they won't be distracted by politics, and hopefully politics will not distract them, because um, I totally agree with you, Marco. The more politics you have around an organization like the PUC, the more difficult it is for the PUC to operate. Uh, and and uh, that means uh, reach good decisions in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, we can't afford a lot of delay, and we can't afford distraction, not in the PUC or anything else in government. So this is a, this is a, forward, this is a forward step, and uh, happy to see it. I'm, and I, uh, you know, uh, I think the, uh, the Senate should confirm without any issue at all. Um, and so uh, when would she take her seat? Uh, immediately? Do you know, Marco? Well, as far as I know, uh, Commissioner Akiba, she has not telegraphed, uh, from what I've heard, any desire to step down before her term ends. And her term formally comes to an end. The last day would be June 30th. June 30th, so we're a little more than two months away from that. So uh, if, if she continues through to the end of her term, then Jenny Potter would take her seat in the uh, triumvirate uh, of uh, Randy Wasse and Jay Griffin and, and Jenny Potter uh, as of July 1st uh, of this year. Well, you know, going forward, we're, we're at a place where we're still kind of uh, making distance uh, with what happened with Nextera and the politics you mentioned, and <clears throat> and uh, rolling up our sleeves, because we're getting closer to 2040, 20, 20, 2045. 20, Everybody uh, recognizes that you have to get into the weeds about those things. You have to arrange the details. And I think this, uh, this PUC, with the, the three of them, that is uh, uh, Randy and Jay and Jennifer, uh, will we'll, we'll address that. Uh, we need to do that, and we need to, we need to uh, move with all alacrity. So I think we're in a good place. Moreover, um, you know, I've noticed, and I'm sure you have too, that uh, Randy has been willing to come down and talk to us and answer questions, unscripted conversations. Likewise, Jay has been very willing to come down, and he's been a great guest on Think Tech with you and me. And I, I suspect that Jennifer is exactly the same way, willing to discuss it, willing to engage with the public, willing to engage with the industry. Um, and I think that that kind of openness uh, is the best possible thing for the PUC going forward, especially in a time when it's going to take, uh, you know, a, a lot of collaboration to move the needle. Well, and to put in a, a plug for, uh, for having Jenny on, she has tentatively agreed to be on our show on the 7th of, of May, 7th of May, so four weeks from today. Uh, Ms. Potter uh, hopefully will be on the show, and we will learn all kinds of interesting things from her and get her get a chance to uh, to introduce her to the Think Tech Hawaii audience. Yeah, by that time, presumably she'll be confirmed. Yes, because the the legislature formally ends uh, uh, the end of this month. That that's when the session wraps up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All good. Let's talk about some of the bills that are pending in the legislature. I guess the one that comes to mind first is, is uh, what is it, HB 2100, or is it SB 2100? That's SB 2100. And that's all about tax credits. This is, you know, finally a bill looks like it's going to pass around tax credits. You want to summarize the provisions, the salient provisions, Marco? Sure. So just, you know, as I mentioned before, the renewable energy tax credits, which we've had here in Hawaii for, get this now, Jay, more than 40 years, more than 40 years, the state of Hawaii has supported through direct and tangible efforts, has supported renewable energy for four decades. And right now, the renewable energy tax credit has no sunset date. In other words, it's not scheduled to go away. Mm -hmm. uh, which is somewhat unusual for tax credits uh, because they usually have a sunset date, just like the federal investment tax credit that uh, we can uh, take advantage of 
from uh, the Fed uh, has a, a ramp down that's now scheduled and will sunset uh, for residential use in the next uh, handful of years. So the same thing with Act 221 back back a few years ago uh, that had a sunset on it. What's interesting there is that the legislature killed it before the, the sunset date. <laughs> but but I, a lot of I agree a lot of tax credit bills have sunsets. That's the normal course. So this particular bill, it's uh, at least the third attempt over the past three years, two years actually, the third attempt to establish a ramp down for the renewable energy tax credit, which by the way, I'll just continue to remind people that as far as the, uh, what I'll describe as the hit on the state's general fund, this tax credit has had the largest hit over the past years than any other state tax credit available. In the most recent years, the data that we have, 2013, 2014, 2015, it's almost a half a billion, as in B, half a billion dollars that effectively did not go into the state's general fund because of the renewable energy tax credit, which I have argued consistently I think is worth it in terms of the overall economic proposition for the state getting off renewable, uh, getting off uh, imported fossil fuels and so forth. But clearly when you start hitting half a billion dollars in several years, you're not talking about chump change, you're talking about real money. So HB, sorry, Senate Bill 2100 uh, was passed by the last House committee that it needed to clear last week, which was uh, Sylvia Luke's Finance Committee or the Numbers Committee. And I compared the HD House Draft Version 2, which came out of Luke's Committee, compared to the Senate Draft 2 or SD2 that came out of the Senate. And they're very, very, very close. The big difference is, interestingly, Jay, the big difference is that the House Draft HD2 didn't put any maximum monetary caps for any of the tax credits, whether it's solar thermal, solar electric, solar with storage, or storage uh, alone, or wind. What do you mean so, monetary caps, Marco? What is that? Well, for example, 35 uh, percent, the current state tax credit for, for solar PV residential is 35 percent or $5,000, whichever is less per system, however the system uh, in quotation marks is defined. So what the House Draft 2 version removed was 35 percent. They kept the 35 percent or the 25 percent or the 30 percent, depending on which tax credit it was. But they removed the maximum dollars cap. So it's 35 percent and then they left it blank in terms of what the max cap is. Or 25 percent, they left it blank what the max monetary cap is. So I find it rather odd that you had the numbers committee in the House that decided to take out some of the most important numbers. So why did they do this? Well, uh, all I can do is surmise that they decided to essentially punt this particular question of are they going to allow 5,000 per system, 2,000 per system, 3,000, 8,000, pick the number. Uh, they're punting that particular question to the conference committee, which will, assuming that the bill passes the entire House, which I expect that it will next week, it'll be uh, referred to a conference committee where you'll most likely have Chris Lee on the House side and Senator Lorena Noy on the Senate side and, and a handful of others who will be trying to work out a compromise between the HD version and the SD version. And uh, apparently that's where hopefully there will be consensus on what those maximum monetary caps will be. Well, apparently there isn't consensus yet. Um, and the, uh, I guess the House wouldn't agree exactly with what the Senate put in that bill as it crossed over. Yeah, but why didn't they put anything, Jay? That's what I find just puzzling. I mean, this is the Numbers Committee, and the Numbers Committee took out the numbers. Uh, that's a good point. And, and regrettably, uh, you know, the public won't have a hearing. They won't see this happen. It'll be essentially uh, in the quiet of a, of, a, um, of, a, of a committee meeting in, in which the public is not necessarily present. In, in, in a hearing capacity. So um, we'll see what we'll see, huh? I, we'll be, I'm sure you're going to follow that because it's a very meaningful part of the bill. The, the, the ceilings are, um, gee, they affect everybody who gets the benefit of the bill. Maybe they have to work out the math and see what's this going to cost, and they won't know exactly until they hit the ceiling. So I, I agree with your characterization is that it's a punt. And I, for now, you know, Marco, I'm, I'm going to punt also. I'm going to punt. 
<laughs> I knew you were coming up with the segue, Jim. I, I'm going to punt right into a right into a uh, a break here. So that's uh, Marco Mangelstor, Provision Solar, joins us from Hilo by Zoom and and VoIP. And um, we'll be right back after the short break for more about what's happening in the legislature and in the country on clean energy right now. Hey, aloha, Stan Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii, where community matters. This is the place to come to think about all things energy. We talk about energy for the grid, energy for vehicles, energy in transportation, energy in maritime, energy in aviation. We have all kinds of things on our show, but we always focus on hydrogen here in Hawaii because it's my favorite thing. That's what I like to do. But we talk about things that make a difference here in Hawaii, things that should be a big changer for Hawaii, uh, and we hope that you'll join us every Friday at noon on Stand the Energy Man and take a look with us at new technologies and new thoughts on how we can get clean and green in Hawaii. Aloha. Good afternoon. My name is Howard Wig. I am the proud host of Code Green, a program on Think Tech Hawaii. We show at 3 o'clock in the afternoon every other Monday. My guests are specialists both from here and the mainland on energy efficiency which means you do more for less electricity and you're generally safer and more comfortable while you're keeping dollars in your pocket. Okay, we're back, we're, we're, <clears throat> we're, uh, we're live, we're here with uh, Marco Mangelsdorf and me, and Mina Morita, but not today. Uh, here on a given Monday, talking about energy, current developments in energy, and especially the legislature, which is meeting right now. So um, there were other points about uh, uh, SB 2100. What were they, Marco? Uh, I simply wanted to, to note, to me, kind of the two big takeaways are from the current, ver both the House and the Senate versions of SB 2100. One is that it would ramp down the state tax credits for solar over time, which uh, is, is a negative for the solar business and also a negative for homeowners, consumers, business owners who would be uh, going, moving forward in the years to come. In other words, they would get a smaller tax credit. Uh, but the, the positive takeaway, which I think more than offsets the negative one of the tax credits ramping down, is that there would be a separate state tax credit established for adding battery storage to existing renewable energy generating facilities. And I, I'm not absolutely sure, Jay, but I believe that we would be the first in the country to actually establish a separate state tax credit to support the retrofit of storage to existing solar electric, in this case, solar electric systems. So under that provision, then I already have solar, I want to add batteries, which, you know, I suppose most people with solar would like to do that. Now, this will incentivize them to add batteries in a retrospective way. They'll have another separate new tax credit to incentivize them to add battery, add storage uh, to their existing solar system. Am I right? Correct. And, and just to play the numbers a little bit, let's say that uh, Jay Fidel decided, you know, I really would feel better if I had some battery storage because that would provide a level of uh, peace of mind security uh, in case the grid were to go down. And let's just make the numbers really easy. Let's say you're considering a $10,000 battery addition to your existing PV system. Well, I think, uh, again, not being an, a tax attorney nor a, a CPA, I'll caveat anything and everything I say in terms of being for you being able to accrue the tax credits, that that's up to you, your conscience, and consulting with your own tax advisor. But there's enough uh, uh, information out there for me to say that you should slash may be able to qualify for the 30 percent investment tax credit, which is... 30% of 10,000, well, that's easy to do. That's 3,000, right? And if the state tax credit is enacted into law, the figure that has been used in both the House and the Senate versions of this bill would be 25%, 25% of the cost of adding storage to your system with a max cap of, let's say, 3,000 or $5,000. So 
So 25% of 10,000 is 2,500, right? So you've got 30% ITC, 2,500 from the state. That brings down your 10,000 initial purchase down to 4,500. So you are, in effect, getting a 55% uh, discount or buy down through the federal and state tax credit, which to me is quite the incentive. And I think it may take a little bit of time for that to disseminate amongst the, the buying public. But I believe that type of incentive where the state and the feds are going to effectively pay for more than half of the cost of the battery addition, I think it truly is just a matter of time before word gets out. First adopters like you and me and some of these other customers I have who are going this route will talk to their friends and they talk to their friends and they talk to their friends and we'll have a hopefully a, something of a boom, a mini boom, when it comes to adding battery storage to existing uh, PV systems. Yeah, two points on that, though. One is, um, and I'm playing the devil's advocate here, why should I, who, who doesn't have a, a PV installation and who won't, Therefore, I won't have a, an issue about storage. I won't do storage, uh, and I won't um, get any tax credit. Why should I pay into the general fund, pay my tax payments, so that the guy down the block gets that kind of benefit? Is it really necessary for me to pay him to get his system up and running with batteries when I don't benefit at all by what he does? What's your answer to that? Well, my answer is that you must be channeling Mina in the in her absence because that's more or less <laughs> Mina's position, and it, it's it's certainly a reasonable one. And my not so much counter to that, uh, but my response to that would simply be that it really comes down to the degree to which the the grid in terms of greater resiliency and Hawaii in terms of the greater economic well-being of Hawaii being able to further reduce our consumption of fossil fuels, what level of public benefit writ large is accrued by more and more and more homeowners and business owners, who of which we have more than 80,000, Jay, more than 80,000 rooftop solar systems across the state, highest per capita in the whole damn country. So let me ask you the second question that flows out of this. Why, why don't we give the utility um, this kind of tax break? Uh, I don't know if it qualifies under this bill, but this kind of tax break, a tax credit, a tax you know, incentive of some kind, so the utility builds more batteries around more solar. Because if you build um, solar at the utility scale with batteries at the utility scale, uh, that benefits everybody. Then everybody's tax money is going, you know, to benefit the entire community. Wouldn't that be a better approach? Well, in fact, in uh, SB 2100, there are provisions for uh, commercial utility, uh, commercial scale storage with uh, in the House. And sorry, in the Senate version, SC two, that was with a max cap of five hundred thousand. So when you're talking about utility scale, you're talking about considerably more than that. So uh, I guess to answer your point, Jay, the bill is not just for, wouldn't be just for residential storage. It would also be for larger scale storage to incentivize larger scale storage to go in as well. What about utility scale storage? That is unknown at this time, and obviously, you know, the folks at HECO and KIUC are very interested in seeing how it's going to play out in terms of mm -hmm. how it will affect uh, the deployment of utility-scale storage, which the folks, our friends at KIUC, have been, as you know, very aggressive, very proactive in doing with the uh, couple, one that's already on the ground that was installed by Solar City in the past year or so, and then another one that's going to be put in by AES in Virginia using SunPower Solar Modules and Samsung battery storage. So this is of, of big importance to, to both HECO and KIUC, to what extent this tax credit is going to be accruing for utility-scale storage. So I don't have a, a specific answer for you yet. It's pending. You know, I was telling you during the break that it's my view that if you want to change the way a community works, um, you can't just ask them nicely. Um, you, you know, government has to give incentives, change the way people conduct themselves. And if we want to reach, um, you know, 100 percent by 2045, we're going to have to give incentives to change the way people conduct themselves. That includes electric cars, by the way. They're not going to do it for love. They're going to do it because it's a better deal. If I can buy an electric car cheaper or batteries cheaper or a photovoltaic cheaper, then I'm more likely to do that. And over a macro 
analysis, that's what you've got to do. That's the way it works in, in, our, in our society. Um, but let me ask you, suppose that, you know, this bill passes and we have lots of new tax credit type incentives for storage um, and for sort of, you know, photovoltaic as well. Um, how does that affect things? Do you have a sense of, does that, does that take us closer to 100 percent? How fast? Um, at what sort of expense? Uh, how is it going to change the landscape? You said, and I agree, there might be a run on this sort of thing, you know, a tremendous expansion. Uh, people have been waiting to see what happens, and a lot of people, uh, they, they like the good old days where they can get a, you know, double credit. Now, this is going to give them, um, you know, not only that, but credit on storage. Um, how is this going to affect the society? Got any ideas? Well, it's going to lead to a greater, more rapid deployment of storage. Uh, to what extent it's going to be kind of uh, incremental growth versus more J-curve growth, uh, it's too early to say. I mean, one of the challenges is being able to get a hold of adequate supplies of, of battery storage uh, products. And uh, in fact, uh, I don't think I'm you know, giving away any, any trade secrets, but uh, the folks at the Tesla Gigafactory outside of Reno have had uh, a challenge keeping up with the demand and the demand for the the power wall which is 13 and a half kilowatt hour residential size battery storage which i have on, on my house as well and i've been testing it very successfully for the past handful of months is uh there was a uh, kind of a giant sucking sound to use ross perot language giant sucking sound uh, in puerto rico of puerto rico based on the devastation that island suffered uh, drawing a lot of product a lot of battery storage product so we're not at a point yet where there is a plethora or overabundance of battery storage right now, Jay. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's the, the undoubted, undoubtedly the price of storage is going to go down over time because there's going to be more and more gigafactory scale product or projects coming online, South Korea and People's Republic of China. But right now, there's not an overabundance of product. Therefore, uh, you know, if my business selling Tesla batteries were to take off or my competitors selling some other product, I mean, uh, that's all well and good. But if we're telling people, gee, thanks so much for the sale, uh, we can get to you in about seven months. I mean, that's that's yeah. that doesn't float too many boats. That discourages people. Yeah. And they, and they may not follow through on that. They want to do it right now. So uh, let me let me ask you, too, though. What about China? I mean, I, 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 it's great that Tesla's manufacturing these batteries in the country, the Powerwall. Uh, and it's great that, uh, you know, we can buy them uh, without t uh, tariff problems from South Korea. And uh, they make some pretty good, tech, you know, technology in South Korea. But China, don't we have a problem with the administration trying to stop China from exporting to the United States? I, I don't know if it is on their list right now, but uh, batteries and solar would be an obvious target for tariffs, wouldn't it? Yeah, uh, you make a good point. Uh, the uh, since they're, you know, the, the battery storage industry globally is still in its infancy. It's still in the crib, so to speak. It hasn't jumped out of the crib and started to walk, let alone sprint. So it would be premature for any uh, for the Trump administration to say well, we want to keep Chinese batteries out of the country because there ain't many coming into the country to begin with. But I'm looking at a chart right now for, that was uh, from Bloomberg couple months ago, Jay, that lists uh, the planned uh, battery cell uh, manufacturing facilities uh, that are on the drawing board are actually being constructed, and the, 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 the Tesla Gigafactory is the largest on the planet. In fact, it's the biggest building by footprint on the, on yeah, the entire planet. Yeah, heard that, yeah. But the next, the next nine projects, uh, or excuse me, the next eight projects, no, the next nine projects are... Uh, Five of them, or six of them, are uh, from China, or would be in China. So, and the other three being from South Korea. So, what that means simply is that uh, there, there's a tremendous amount. There's going to be a tremendous increase in volume of battery storage that will be hitting the global markets within the next handful of years. And that's when things are really going to get interesting. So, will the Chinese dominate in battery storage as they have in solar PV? Uh, I think there's a strong case that could be made for that, especially when you look at the fact that some of the key components going into lithium ion, including something called cobalt, uh, guess where the two biggest sources of cobalt are in the world? One of them is the People's Republic of China. The other is the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is smack in the middle of Africa, and that's not known for being a terribly stable mm -hmm. or safe part mm -hmm. of the world. Mm -hmm.
Well, you know, it strikes me that the start that this uh, House Bill 2100 and the whole idea about incentivizing storage is uh, really the beginning of a, a brand new and tremendous chapter, not only for us, but it reflects uh, a chapter ha happening in, in, in other places as well along the same lines. This is, this is the next leg of the journey toward 100 percent, for sure. And um, I, I really appreciate uh, that people are paying attention to it now. Next thing we got to do is transportation, though. Anyway, Marco, great to talk to you. We're out of time. I'm sorry we didn't cover two or three things. Um, but, you know, there's always uh, two weeks from, from hence, and we can cover a lot of additional things then, right? Well, as my dear beloved grandmother, Celeste Ellis, who lived for decades and decades in beautiful Manoa Valley, said she always has to save stuff for the next time. Okay. That's what we'll do. We're saving stuff for the next time with Marco Mangelsdorf, ProVision Solar, joining us from Hilo, Hawaii. Thank you so much, Marco.